Now the Jews and the, well, chief priests and elders, and of course the Jews, putting their hand to it all, they would get up early in the morning, they'd rise to do this wicked deed, and they indeed believed that they could do away with the truth. This interloper, as they would view him, who would destroy their position. And so they got up and they dressed and they put on their robes and their hats, paraded themselves through the streets to come into probably the temple to do the dirty deed. Prancing around amongst the people, holier than thou, presenting themselves to be, and the people bowing down and scraping to them, admiring them. Just as today, he walked past the Church of England, man there with a fish's head on his head, hat on his head rather, and all these Nancy garments, like a big girl's blouse and his crow's ear, and the people are there virtually kissing his hands. And he's just pronounced against the truth of God in that place. And it is the same all the way round. And you see men there mimicking popery. Putting these plastic dog collars round their necks. And wishing to be called reverend. And what do we say to them? Have you been in the park have you? Have a run around in the park Mr Dog? Hey, eh? outside justification there are dogs and how fitting these people are that they put dog collars on and they don't know what they're doing they pride themselves they want people to see that they belong to Christianity that they are ministers and their excuse is that therefore the people will approach them and they can give them the good news. Eh? The good news. How absolutely pathetic, irreverent, godless that is. There is no good news to the wicked. Only wrath. There is no peace to the wicked, saith my God. Only wrath revealed from heaven. There's no good news. Salvation doesn't begin with good news. The term good news is a positive spin of man that is put upon a fallacious salvation. And who is the author? He belongs to this world. August Comte, spin everything, he says, put a positive view and a positive spin on everything. When it comes to salvation, you die. You don't choose, you die. When the law revived, I died. And as Luther rightly said, the Lord slays those whom he is going to save. And unless he divinely kills you to yourself, to all that is self, you will never be born again. It's bad news first, good news second. The only good news is when you are in, when we are indeed in the new Jerusalem that stands not only for the bride of Christ, but for justification by faith. The gospel is not good news. Ask the Jews when this gospel shall be preached throughout the world, then shall the end come. Jesus Christ said that to the Jews. The end of your rule, the end of your kingdom, the end of your position in this world, and it did. It came in AD 70 under the Romans. So it wasn't good news to them. The gospel begins with bad news. 
and indeed for the wicked, the truly wicked, the gospel. I'll just say this, the gospel, they don't want to know. Because the gospel begins with something that people don't wish to adhere to. And even Darby, that Satanist, understood that. You see in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, we read, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Not in heaven or on earth, but in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. All right, to those that dwell on the earth. In other words, they are taken up with the earth. They go around and do their shopping and they're concentrating on what they're going to buy and what they're going to do when they go to work and get home and they put this abomination on in the corner and worship that and they're all tied and wedded to the earth. They dwell on the earth. And I saw another angel, okay, in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God. That is the first part of the everlasting gospel. Fear God. That is Indeed, the first commandment, fear God and give glory to him. Do you think the wicked wish to give glory to God and to worship him? To give glory to him? No, this is the gospel. For the hour is of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. Some idiots Wicked people indeed will say this gospel is yet to be preached. Well, you've just condemned the angel of God. Because if any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. That's another gospel according to you lot. Ignorant lot. Hmm? And I love it how you lot, you neo-evangelicals, say, Oh, God loved the world, and he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, then, what do you do with James 4 and 4? If any man love this world, he is the enemy of God. So you're saying that God is a hypocrite. Yeah. Talk about blind leaders of the blind. Hmm? And there's multitudes of them. And I feel sorry for the young Christians that have to face all this out here in this world of people representing themselves as Christians giving out false doctrine, false teaching, heresies, blasphemies, you name it, they've got it, they speak it, they preach it from the pulpits, from the streets, they write it up in books, There's, go into a bookshop and you see hundreds of these books. The poor young Christian doesn't know what, which way to turn. Well, you just turn to the Puritan works, the, the ones you can trust. Hmm? To the Matthew Henrys, John Calvins, the Luthers, the Flavels of this world. They are the only ones to really read, you know, the Bunyans. And of course, ministers don't tell you this. Oh, no. <laughs> Why should they? They're picking ignorant themselves. <laughs> hmm? Now all these chief priests and elders, they thought, oh, we have now got rid of this thorn in the side, in our sides, didn't they? Eh? They thought that they'd got rid of the truth. Washed their hands, handed the truth over to the Gentiles. And so the Lord Jesus Christ came over to us. And they fought to destroy the truth. But you know in the end the truth destroyed them. Because the truth is absolute. And we got that. A wall of truth you cannot get over. You cannot get round. Because it is absolute. 
Emma cannot pass truth. It can attack truth, but it cannot pass truth. Truth is ultimate, is absolute. Nothing can be done against the truth, only for the truth. And this is what happened here, as in every other case. The truth was upheld, the wicked tried to get to destroy the truth, but what they did was to enhance the truth, because salvation of the church was sealed up because of their actions against the truth. She was sealed up once for all forever. Hmm? And of course, by divine act of God, if error is to have peace with the truth, it has to be a divine act of God, not an act of man. Because man is intrinsically opposed to God, to the truth. And we will say this in closing. When we're talking about the truth, we're talking about the truth as absolute. The truth was crucified <coughs> at Calvary. Because Jesus Christ is truth. And he is the way, the truth and the life. When the Lord Jesus Christ allowed himself by a decree of God which he was fulfilling to be crucified at Calvary for his beloved, that attack continues on because the enemy does not wish to accept that it was defeated at Calvary. And so it is that when we come to the word of God, the absolute truth of God, men down the ages have sought to destroy it. And of course the greatest attack, aside from the burning of Bibles and their translators, came more subtly in the 1800s with various versions of the scriptures and people like C.H. Spurgeon promoting them, the RSV, Revised Standard Version, promoting them, putting his name to them, standing in a pulpit, saying that, pr promoting them. And like the sorcerers <clears throat> before Moses, they've been unable to stop. One version leads to another version, to another version, another version, and they go on and on and on. And the rhetoric is always the same. This is a better version than the previous version. This is more authentic. This is more authoritative. And when we pick up these books, that's all they are. <laughs> which represent themselves by man as being the word of God, because man says and is determined to say that it is the word of God. How dare any man say that what they have put together by a committee of infidels is the word of God. When we read these works, we see the heresy in them, we not only see the heresy, we see no Spirit of God attending them. They are just dead words that man has put together in books and said this is more to the original than <clears throat> the King James 1611 Cambridge edition. All right. Now we say the Cambridge edition because we know very well, if we know our Bibles, that the original 1611 
King James authorised, most people couldn't read today. Because it's in a language. In a, <clears throat> a language of the day. Right? The old-fashioned Puritan language. Now, so it had to be put in to, how would you say, English that everybody <coughs> understood. And a reverent English. So God is treated as spoken of as thou, not you. But thou. All the reverential words that were available at the time are within the King James 1611 reverential words because we should reverence God and if we are born again we do reverence God and we seek each and every way to reverence God when we talk about reverence we're talking about Owning that God has done this, he's done that, he's done the other. When we go through fiery trials, thou hast brought these about, O Lord, see me through. I bow to your providential workings. This fiery trial is from thee, O God. Help me through them, guide me through them, give me patience through them, always to acknowledge that it is of thy hand. Never let me look around to find fault anywhere. It's of thy hand to try the silver. The Lord Jesus Christ sits there as a refiner of silver <clears throat> to refine our characters. Simple as that. Not to refine us to be saved because we are saved. From the very, very eternity that we were found in, as lively spirits, well, rather lively thoughts of God, the Lamb was slain for us. The Lamb was slain for us. That's what we read in Revelation 13, <coughs> pardon me, 13 verse 8, for us, not for the world. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names on sorry that's right and all <clears throat> that dwell upon the earth shall worship him that's the beast whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world so you see there is a people that is set apart in eternity that will worship the beast and a people on the opposite side that are written up in the Lamb's book of life the Lamb accounted as being slain from the foundation of the world therefore prior to Calvary there were saved souls because the Lamb was accounted as being slain from the foundation of the world for those in the Lamb's book of life and the Noahs and the <clears throat> Adams and the Eves and the Enoch's, etc., the Job's, the David's, the Solomon's, the Hannah's, were all written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Therefore, they were all had the surety that is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God in the Old Testament, whom has been accepted of God in the New Testament, as it were. In, <coughs> well, rather, pardon me. He was accepted under the Old Testament, has been the so all-sufficient one, sufficient sacrifice, the spotless sacrifice for the church. Once he was accepted, then came the New Testament. And more openly declared at Pentecost. New Testament began when the Lord Jesus Christ died and rose again. And the witness to it was Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost was given to the church. 
And so it is <clears throat> that we go through this life knowing that our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ has secured us. And that when the wicked rise up, God is on our side, regardless of the situation, regardless of the trials that we go through, regardless of anything, absolutely anything, God is there. We may indeed not always recognise it at the time, but God is there. Because the overwhelming <clears throat> trial can get too much and sort of blank out. But God is there. You see, we did not choose this way. This is our comfort as much as anything else. We didn't choose to become Christians. Hmm? We did not choose this way. But God chose it for us. Seeing that he chose it for us, there was a purpose for him to choose it for us and to put us through trials and tribulations in this world and to return unto Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon our heads. Hmm? And we take comfort in that. And we take comfort that we stand not by law, but by divine faith. Hmm? That we have not, or we do not, stand by what we have determined to do, but by what God hath determined to do. That's the thing. We stand not by what we have determined to do, all right, but by what God hath determined to do. He having determined to do whatever he wished to do and wishes to do, it will be done. Doesn't matter what man says, God has determined to do of his own good will and pleasure and not one human being can thwart him. And I'll say this, if you think for one moment that you can overpower God, that makes you almighty. And if you think it, you're listening to the devil. If you think for one moment that you can lose your salvation, you're listening to the devil and the children of the devil. That's what you're doing, because you can't. You can't overpower God. God is infinite. He is almighty. He's omnipotent, omnipresent. He is all. We're nothing. God has simply determined to do what he has determined to do, and he will see it through because he is God. So therefore, our great confidence is that God will finish the work that he hath determined to do. Calvary was determined of God. Did it fail? No. In the eyes of the world, it failed. Failed, completely failed. Christ being a good man, a prophet, <clears throat> all right, to the world, was mistaken by the Jews and put to death. You see, he was mistaken in the way that they didn't see that he was their Messiah, all right, that they determined was to be their Messiah. Of course, we know he was the Messiah of the church, the true Jerusalem that is above. The true people of God that are above. Now the world says, oh, well, he upset the Jews and therefore, being upset, they had him crucified and he could do nothing about it. Eh? 
<laughs> Absolutely godless, irreverent. And that idea has come into neo evangelical Christendom. Hmm? Who worship another Jesus, another God, another Saviour, another King being darkened in their ungodly hearts. Hmm? And we have it from our neo evangelicalism. And we'll close with this. You young Christians, look around, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, listen to what so called professors of religion are saying, and ask the question are they telling the truth? And are they Christians? Look at the great campaign movement. Look at the great names that have been put forward. Hmm? As well as the great campaign movement. They're all false. Great campaign movement is from the devil. Common saying amongst many sayings is you must be soul winners. <laughs> That's heresy and blasphemy. Because Jesus Christ has saved every soul that is to be saved via Calvary hmm? that's what he's done he's saved every soul only God can save souls man cannot oh what did he lead them to Christ yes well Christ is invisible how do you lead a dead soul to a living person who is invisible behind the veil it has to be a divine work of God not of man Decisions of man, they go to hell. Simple as that. Decisions do not save, they cannot save, they cannot enter another world. The soul is as dead after a decision is made for this phony God that is around, this phony Jesus that is around, this phony gospel that is around, the phony word of God that is around, the phony ministers <clears throat> that are preaching their heresies from their pulpits, the Miles Monroes, the Joyce Mayers, the Billy Grahams, the Defo Dollars and the rest of them. Hmm? And the great names, the C.H. Spurgeons, the Henry Grattan Guinnesses, D.L. Moody's, Finneys of this world, the Tozers, the Lloyds of this world. These icons whom we are supposed to look up to don't. Question everything, my friend. Question everything. Don't listen to that man down the road. If he's saying that, say Ian Paisley if you like, or C.H. Persian. That they were good ministers, blessed of God, anointed of God, were the preachers of God, and they did this for God, and they did that for God, and many wonderful works for God, and blah, blah, blah. Don't listen to them. Ask the question. That name that they've quoted, are the persons that they are citing, all right, true children of God get their history not the biased history just read the history you'll find that 99.9% .9 of the time the persons that they are quoting are not Christians they're not Christians at all not one jot they have all made their decisions for religion all right Christianity made their decisions. And of course that means that they are only professors of Christianity. And this is what the Lord Jesus Christ says to us. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Yes, you have, Mr. Spurgeon. Hmm? And in thy name have cast out devils. Oh yes, Mr. Um, Smith Wigglesworth. 
Right? And in thy name, we've cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Oh, yes, you have. Haven't you? Hmm? George Mueller. Right? And the rest of you. But I say unto you, hmm? Then I will profess unto you, unto them rather, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These are to the famous names as much as anything else. Famous names prided themselves in their works for God, while well, Jesus, as they say, and have said, well, look at me. I'm <clears throat> Aren't I wonderful? Holier than thou. I have a great reward in heaven hereafter. Better than you. This is what they think. Better than you. And what does Jesus Christ say here? I never knew you. Hmm? And of course, when the Lord Jesus Christ says, I never knew you, in different parts of the scriptures, like Matthew 25, for instance, 13, where we read, um, rather 12, But he answered, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I know you not. This is a parable, all right? These are met whole heavenly metaphors, all right? And this not knowing them means that justification is here speaking, that justification never knew them. Because the Lord Jesus Christ knows each and every person, every animal, every speck of dust that he has created. This is simply referring to justification by faith. The voice of justification speaking here says, I never knew you, I never died for you, I never justified you, I never put you right before God, I never propitiated for you, never reconciled you to God and to the Israel of God. You simply had a lamp of profession, you had no heart, i.e. the vessel, you just had a lamp of profession which lasted for so long and then went out. And I'll say this. I'll say this. Watch what people do that profess great things. Because in the end, take the example of Judas and Demas. All right. Did they last until the end? No. Because they weren't saved. They walked off. They denied the truth. They turned their back on the truth. And they went off their own way. Watch these people. See what they do in the end. Hmm? There are very, very, very few that outwardly show that they are not apostates. All right. Let's give a recent example. Ian Paisley goes into the Church of Rome. Always, throughout his ministry, preached against the Church of Rome. Did he last till the end? No. They that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. In other words, the same are saved. You will endure to the end. If you've stood up against popery, you will die. Preaching against popery. And let's say one other thing here, that there are those indeed that may preach against Popery until their dying breath. But look at what they've preached. That's the second thing. Well, that's the main thing. Test the spirits. See what they are by what they preach. And if it's heresy, it's because they're heretics and they are not in the kingdom of God. Because the Holy Spirit does not teach error. So all these error mongers that go about, for instance, saying that we need the second blessing, they're error mongers. They're not in the kingdom of God. We are in the kingdom of God. We see things as they are. And the more mature we are, the more things that we see. We see the straightness of them. These are error mongers. We preach against them. We preach against the Spurgeons, the Tories, 
the DL Moody's and we become and don't be surprised at this because you will become as we become the enemies within even within our own ranks hey eh? do I become your enemy because I tell you the truth says Paul yes and why is that because you've not matured to the level that we have and that maturity we give unto God it's not of us we work for it God has determined to have us to work for it and therefore the glory goes back to God not to us we are what we are because God has determined us to be what we are and we at the end of the day again strive to be good students of the word of God to take in the history that surrounds all of us the history of the world the history of the church and we deal every day with everyday things and we are to learn and to understand everyday things to be wise in this world that means keeping your eyes open keeping our ears open not blinkering them. Ooh, don't want to hear that about D.L. Moody. Ooh, no, 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 no. Face it. I mean, we're talking now about a man who was a papist in his heart. He wanted to join the Church of Rome. He did not mind going into the Mass, partaking of the Mass. Hello, Ian. <laughs> Isn't it? Hmm? Let us be honest in all things. The Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the day was taken hold of by wicked hands and slain put to death by the Romans and yet by the Jews. How cunning this world is. You know, it does one thing and says, Oh, I'm not to blame. It was them over there. It was Pontius Pilate. We're not to blame. Oh no, 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 no we Jews are, are to totally innocent. We didn't put the sword, we didn't nail Jesus Christ to the cross. Oh no, no, we just handed him over. Oh, we didn't, we didn't know he was going to be put to death. This is what they would say. But the scriptures tell us that in their hearts they gathered themselves together against the Lord and his anointed to put him to death. You see? This is what happens in the world. The world has full of words to try and get away from the evil that they do. Oh, it's not me either. Oh, I'm not at fault. Oh, no, no, no. Don't blame me. I'm not the one. Oh, my upbringing. You know, it's anything and everything. Blame somebody else. Don't take the blame yourself. That's what the world does. That's what the Jews here did. Oh, no. And the apostles pointed out to the Jews you put him to death you put the Lord of glory to death they were denying it they denied it read the Acts of the Apostles the Jews were denying having put the Lord of glory to death you see they knew they be began to know and knew that they had done wrong and they wouldn't own up to the wrong <clears throat> they put a guard over the sepulchre just in case our work, what was it? In case our second mistake, I can't remember the, quite the words, but they understood they made a mistake. That the mistake would come back upon them. That's how it is with the world. Well, we'll leave it at that. <laughs>